This is problem 5-142. It's on page 266. An adiabatic piston cylinder device equipped with a spring maintains the pressure inside at 300 kilopascals when the volume is zero and 3,000 kilopascals when the volume is 5 cubic meters. The device is connected to a steam line maintained at 150, or 1,500 kilopascals and 200 degrees Celsius. And initially the volume is zero. Determine the final temperature and quality if appropriate when the valve is opened and steam in the line is allowed to enter the cylinder until the pressure inside matches that in the line. Also determine the total work produced during this adiabatic filling process. All right, here it is. All right, let's sketch what's going on here. We've got a spring tied to ground that maintains pressure on a piston of a piston cylinder device. Now the initial volume V1 is zero, so this is state one. And there's a supply line where we can allow steam to enter the conditions of the steam in the line, which is just a constant. This is the supply line is P equals 1500 kilopascals, temperature equals 200 degrees Celsius. Now, we're told it's adiabatic, and so that means that there's no heat transfer crossing the system boundary. I'm going to take the, the insides of the piston cylinder device to be the system. But we're told that during this filling process, the nature of that spring, and along with the atmosphere and everything around it, is that from zero to five cubic meters of volume, the pressure goes from, did you get that right, is it zero psi or 300? Three, uh, 300 kilopascals. So the pressure in kilopascals goes from 300 kilopascals at zero all the way up to 3,000 kilopascals at five cubic meters. Now I've drawn a linear line between those two data points that they've given us, but they didn't tell us it was linear. How would you know that it's linear? How did I know it was linear? Just a guess? Well, you see a spring, so you'd assume that the spring was linear, right? That makes sense. But what else causes pressure in this system? Let's say we've got the valve off, put a little steam in there, shut the valve. What causes pressure in the system? Well, maybe the atmosphere around, the weight of the piston, and of course the spring we've already mentioned. Does the weight of the piston change? No. So its addition to the pressure doesn't change. Does the atmospheric pressure change? No. And so its addition to the, to the pressure doesn't change. The only thing that changes is as we compress the spring, the spring increases the pressure because the spring is applying more and more force, and it's a linear spring, so that must be a linear line. All right, the force increases, but the cross-sectional area is constant, therefore from a pressure equals force over area standpoint, the pressure should simply increase linearly. Okay. Now we know that the pressure in state two, it actually does not go all the way up to um, to 3,000 kilopascals. In fact, it stops well below that, let's see, this would be, halfway is going to be, uh, let's think, that was at zero would be halfway, and so it would be closer to here. And at 1,500 kilopascals. Okay. So what are we supposed to find? Well, we're supposed to find the temperature in state two, the quality in state two, if it's applicable, which of course it's going to be, right? Who wouldn't ask us to find it if it wasn't? And the amount of boundary work. Well, what tools do we have to do this? We have mass balances and energy balances. Let's write them down. Mass balance of the system, the mass that comes in. I didn't press record in that. Yes, I did. Okay. The mass that comes in minus mass that leaves, well, no mass leaves, equals the changing mass of the system, M2 minus M1. But we're told 
that begins at a volume of zero, therefore the amount of mass in state zero is zero. So basically we get from this, whatever mass comes in is the mass that's left in state two. Well, that makes sense. Reminds me of a sign some of my relatives have on their door. It says, I've, I started with nothing and I got most of it left still. I like that. The energy balance is basically just that energy in minus energy out equals the change in the energy of the system. Notice between these example problems I've purposely moved from a very detailed to now a very abstract form of it. This energy that comes in can, carry, can be carried in several different forms, same way as the energy that goes out. But still we're talking about deposits, withdrawals, and changes in account balances. And that's what we're talking about here. So now let's make it a little bit more specific. What energy comes in? Well, the mass that comes in carries enthalpy with it. How did I know it carried enthalpy? Not just internal energy. How did I select H instead of U? Because it's a flowing stream, it has to have flow energy. Okay. How about energy that flows out? Isn't there just boundary work? As the, the steam expands the piston, it's doing boundary work, right? Is there any other form that energy flows out in? Well, no mass leaves, no heat leaves, so that's it. How about the change in the energy of the system? Well, there's going to be a total amount of internal energy or thermal energy in state two, and a total amount of internal energy in state one. Notice I've written capital U's here. Of course, we'll be able to make this uh, break it down into more parts, right? The internal energy in state one is zero. Okay. The internal energy in state two is simply M2, U2, where now I've used a specific energy. You see the difference between these two? This is all the thermal energy that all the mass has in state two. This is the internal energy that each kilogram, what are we in? Yeah, we're in metric. So each kilogram has this much energy, and this is, there's this many kilograms in the system, okay? So we've gone from something that's very abstract to something that's much more specific. Now let's see, what do we need? What do we have, what do we need? Uh, the internal energy in state two, uh, let's see, well we'll have to get most of this stuff. Let's see, let's see what we can do. Let, let's tackle the boundary work first. Could we deal with the boundary work? Yes, we can. Let me show you how. The boundary work's actually pretty easy. I have a PV diagram here. What do you know about PV diagrams? Area under the curve equals boundary work. Remember, boundary work is the integral of PDV. Well, if we go from state one here to state two here, then isn't this the boundary work? And by the way, how could I easily calculate that area? It looks like 3,000 now, it's just 300. We're going from that state to that. Well, couldn't you just take this point plus this point over two to get an average pressure and multiply by the, the volume width? Wouldn't that give you the area under that curve? So isn't the boundary work simply P1 plus P2 over two multiplied by the change in volume between the two states? Right. I've selected these problems to purposely show you as many tricks as I know. Okay? So if you keep saying, well, oh my goodness, I'm going to pull this out of a hat. Well, I'm trying to show you all the tricks along the way. Well, delta V, what's that? That's the volume in state two minus the volume in state one. But how much volume is there in state one? There's none. So now we can calculate the boundary work by simply adding the two pressures. Let's see. Oh, yeah, we've got one more thing to do, though. We don't know the volume in state two yet, do we? But we know this is a linear line, so could we figure out this volume? Sure. You could look at it as similar triangles. So this triangle is similar to this triangle, right? 
And so if you think about what that means, what you'll find is that the volume in state two, here, let me, let me write it out. Let me just do it down here. The volume in state two minus zero, that's this distance, divided by this distance, five minus zero, is equal to, let's see, this small height, 1,500 minus 300, divided by this large height, 3,000 minus 300. Well, the zeros go away easily enough. Now we have to do is multiply by 5 on this side to move that 5 over. And we've got it. By the way, that 5 has units of cubic meters. And this numerator and denominator both have units of kilopascals, so it goes away. So the volume in state two, if you if, plug it into your calculator to verify if you will, please. But when I did this, I got 2.22 repeating cubic meters. Please verify that with your calculator if you would. I think I used a point slow or something like that in my solution. I don't remember exactly what I did. I've got it here, but I don't want to take the time to figure it out. But it's the same thing. So there's the volume in state two. We know the pressure in uh, state one and state two. Yeah, we've already used it. So now we can calculate the boundary work. So let's do that next. We'll just remember that we've got a volume of 2.22 repeating cubic meters in state two. So the boundary work, P1, 300, P2, uh, 1,500, not 3,000. Those are both kilopascals over 2. Multiplied by V2, 2.22 repeating cubic meters. Should give us how many kilojoules of boundary work. Well, this comes out to about 2,000 kilojoules of boundary work. That's how much work the gas does in going from state 1 to state 2. Well, that's one of the terms in the energy balance. Now, how will we find, for example, the enthalpy that comes in? Well, that's pretty easy. We can go look this up. So let's do it. Let's go to the back of the book and see if we can find the enthalpy of the incoming steam. We're in metric units, so yeah, we're in metric units. So let's go to the uh, superheated water table. They said it was steam, so I assume it's superheated. And 1,500 kilopascals would be 1.5 megapascals. You'll notice in the book, page 919, we've got 1.4 and 1.6 megapascals. We'd have to interpolate. In fact, we'd have to do a double linear interpolation because the temperature is 200 degrees Celsius, which is just fine in the 1.4 megapascal uh, table. But in the 1.6, it doesn't go down that far. It goes down to 201.37, that's saturation. I'll tell you what I did, I used ease. In fact, I found that the enthalpy of the incoming stream is 2,796 kilojoules per kilogram. It was a lot easier than trying to do a double linear interpolation, which is actually a big thing. Well, now what? Well, let's see. Mass N and M2 are the same thing. And we need the internal energy in state two. So what do we do now? Well, what I did now is I solved it with ease. But I want to go through the thought process with you so that you see we really only have one unknown. Because it looks like we have one equation and two unknowns, right? Basically, if we were to take, let's see, let's, let's just jot down that the boundary work, we figured out that this boundary work is about 2,000. You know what, let me move that over just a little bit more. Kilojoules. 
So now we don't need this anymore. We know the volume in state two, we figured that out. That was 2.22 cubic meters. And what I want to convince you of is that really we only have one unknown, and that unknown is essentially state two. Not the mass in that state necessarily, or the internal energy, but just simply state two. Because look, this would just be M2 HM, which we know, minus boundary work, which we know, equals M2 U2. So we have M2 and U2 as the unknowns. We already solved the boundary work. That's something else they wanted us to find. So no problem there. Now, what else do we have about state two? Well, we have the volume. So this M2 is that M in? MN and M2 are the same thing about the mass balance. Good question. But I've basically I've used up the mass balance in writing that. Okay. So how do, I, how do I deal with this? Well, what you would do is say, well, wait a second. I've got the volume in state 2. So the specific volume in state 2, which is a state 2 property, understand, okay, is equal to the volume in state 2 divided by the mass in state 2. So notice this is a property. U2 is a property. T2 is a property. So is the quality of state 2, by the way, but we'll get to that in a minute. So since all of these are properties, they're really just basically state 2. If we, if you imagine, I just showed you goal seek, right? Imagine we could goal seek with these, which is basically what it does too. If we said state two is here, okay, this temperature, this pressure, we could look up V2, U2, anything we wanted, right? Well, that if we could look up that property, we could get M2. If we could get, so let's say we guess state two, we could get V2, we could get U2, that would give us M2, which we could plug in and check and see if we've got the right state. Do you see how we could iterate by guessing which state we have and then checking? It's about the only way to do it, and that's what Ease did for me, and I, I don't have the program where I'd show it to you. But basically, I had it guess a state, and then check and see if these two, you don't have to tell it explicitly to guess and check. You just put in the equations, uh, and it will, will do it for you. Okay? you just, it'll solve all the equations simultaneously by going and looking up properties, which is what makes Ease kind of nice by comparison to a generic solver. It has the states built into it, if you will. It has the properties built into it. So I was able to have it just solve this because really the unknown is state two. So it guessed a state two, calculated M2, so basically you just take this and rearrange it. M2 equals V2 over little v2, total volume over specific volume. And then you, you guess the state. Look up U2, look up V2, calculate M2, and see if it's the right state. If it's not, guess another one. And it can actually iterate and solve it. Okay. Does that make a little bit of sense? This is the trick you probably wouldn't have thought of. This is one of the equations I had to put into ease to make it solve this problem. Is that the mass in state 2 is equal to 2.22 repeating cubic meters divided by the specific volume in state 2, whatever that happens to be. Questions, comments so far? You might be interested in the answer. The temperature came out to 233.2 degrees Celsius. Uh, 233.2 degrees Celsius. The specific volume associated that with that was 0 0.1458 cubic meters per kilogram. And the mass in state two came out to 15.25 kilograms. So all of that dropped out. And you know, I don't have a note here about whether or not it was still in the saturation region. I didn't write that down, I guess. So I'd have to do this again. I don't know what I've done with this program. I've solved this several, several years ago. So it's probably on one of my many computers at home, who knows. <laughs> Here's what I really want to get across with this problem. There's two things. Number one is that you really need to know intuitively that the boundary work is the area under a PV curve. You need to know that. You also need to know this. 
And you need to get the idea that a state is a collection of properties. It's just one state. It's just one unknown. It's not a specific volume and an internal energy and a temperature and a quality. It's just one state. And once, once you know what state that is, well, then all the other properties are related to it. And they just fall out. Any questions on this problem? Comments? What I'm going to do, I'm going to go home tonight. I'm going to look and see if I can't find the EASE program where I solve this. And then I'll post it on Blackboard underneath the example. Okay? Questions, comments?